Okay, well, good morning. My name is Brian Browning. I'm from the University of Washington, and uh, I've been to several of these meetings, and I'm very much looking forward to the talks that are coming. It's a great way to see a lot about many different areas of genomics. So this talk is about genotype imputation, which is a term that different groups of researchers use in somewhat different ways. And it can be very confusing if you don't know exactly what we mean by this. So what we're talking about in this talk is the technique whereby we take SNP array data and convert it into sequence data. Uh, the inputs for genotype imputation are a dense set of markers, typically half a million, a million, two million markers across the genome. And you can do this in a single individual, but typically it's done on a whole study, a whole cohort of individuals. You have the SNP array data. And then in addition to that, you take a reference panel. The reference panel, you're not really interested in, in the samples. You're not going to be analyzing those samples. But that reference panel of sequenced individuals, that provides you the patterns of alleles that you see, the, the haplotypes, which are sequences of alleles on a single chromosome copy, like the copy you inherited from your mother or the copy you inherited from your father. That haplotype information gives you the, uh, at the markers that you didn't genotype, gives you the information you need to, after you turn the crank, get sequence data on your target samples, okay? Now, another use of genotype imputation, that term, it's also, is for something that sometimes you'll hear called genotype refinement. That's when you actually do have data. It's just noisy. You might have low coverage sequence data. You might have SNP array data, but the DNA was poor quality going into the array and the, and the, allele, the signal intensities are noisy in your micro or SNP array data. In that case, people refer to imputation where you use similar models but somewhat different techniques to estimate the genotypes. That's not what we're talking about here. What we uh, are interested in is when you have no data, whereas the other kind of imputation is you have data is just noisy. So here we have no data. Here we have to use a reference panel because we have no data, whereas the other application, it's noisy data, and you don't necessarily have to use a reference panel. The imputation methods developed really in the first generation of genome-wide association studies, so it's just a little over 10 years old. And if you're not familiar with these studies, I can give you just a quick, quick review of them. They go through the genome and they test every genotype marker, and they're looking for correlations between the number of copies of an allele you carry at that marker and the trait. The trait could be body mass index, it could be height, it could be IQ. Whatever, you're just looking for correlations between carrying an allele and having uh, an increased value for, for some trait. And this typical output you get is a, what we call a Manhattan plot. It's every point in this plot here is a test, a marker that's being tested for association with the trait here, the trait skin color. And on the Y-axis, we have the P minus log of the p-value. So this is on a log scale. Higher values indicate lower p-values. So a, a, a 10 on the y-axis means your p-value is 10 raised to the minus 10th power. A 20 is 10 raised to the minus 20th power, so that's smaller. So high values on the y-axis are good. And we call it Manhattan plot because what we want to see is skyscrapers. So you want these peaks that shoot up above this red dashed line, which is the genome-wide significance threshold. And here there's four regions that they came up with that exceeded that genome-wide significance threshold. And even though there might and may only be one causal variant in the region, you get a whole peak showing, showing up because markers in a region of the genome are correlated. And so you're getting signal from all the markers that are correlated with that one or, or with the multiple causal variants. In the lower right panel, you have a, a blow up of the third of the fourth regions around the APBA2 gene. And here they've divided the markers into the two classes. You have the genotype markers that were on the SNP array and then the imputed markers. Now, it's not evident here because the way they plotted it is first they did the light blue with the imputed markers and then the genotype markers got painted on top of that. So you can't really see all the imputed markers or the, the magnitude of them, but generally, the reason we're interested in doing imputation is it allows us to test a lot more markers, an order of magnitude, perhaps two orders of magnitude. And for a really large reference panel, when those arrive, it'll be three orders of magnitude more markers. 
And, the, and in this example here, you can see that we're the, the largest signal comes from a light blue or an imputed marker, which isn't that surprising when you're testing lots and lots of markers. So imputation gives us a much more fine, fine grained view of the architecture in a region. What, what variants are associated with the trait? It makes it much more likely that we're actually testing the causal variant for association with the trait. On top of this, in addition to running imputation for the initial analysis, where imputation has had, I think, an even bigger impact, is in meta-analysis. So in an individual study, except for now when we're getting biobank scale data for a few biobanks, normally in a genome-wide association study, you don't, have enough, you don't have a huge sample size. You might have a few thousands, a few ten thousands of samples. So where the real power comes from is taking multiple different studies for a trait and doing a meta-analysis. Then you get a much larger sample size and you rad dramatically uh, improve the power. But that's not an easy problem when every study is on a different SNP array. SNP arrays from different vendors can have relatively few markers in common, and that's you don't want to have to deal with the intersection of the markers. You'll have hardly anything left. You won't be test you'll be testing only a small fraction of the markers. <laughs> Imputation is a beautiful solution to this problem. You just take each study, you impute it to the same reference panel, and voila. Everybody's on the same marker, and you just turn the standard meta-analysis crank, and you get uh, a very powerful study. For traits where we've done meta-analysis, typically the vast majority of the associated markers we know about came from the meta-analysis because that huge boost in power. Oops. So how does it work? So typically, what we do is we first phase the data. So we use usually statistical methods to estimate haplotypes. So rather than impute genotypes, what we do is we phase the data, and an individual has two haplotypes. We take each of those haplotypes, and, and for a particular haplotype, we infer the missing alleles. And there's a reference panel. So this is a cartoon we'll be referring to again and again. The, you have the reference haplotypes here. There's normally many more. but for fit conveniently on a slide. We're interested in the, the markers that are polymorphic in the reference panel, and they're color-coded. These other markers that are not in bold face, mentally you just sort of forget about them. I have them there so you can understand that it's sequence data, but mentally you, you sort of ignore them, the markers that aren't polymorphic. Typically in your reference data, we don't even list these markers. We only list markers that are polymorphic in the reference panel. We have three genotyped markers, and then these are the markers we want to impute. And the usual way we do it is we assume the target haplotype is copying sec segments of the reference haplotypes. And we can represent that copying by a path. So here the target haplotype we think of is copying the first reference haplotype, and then it switches down and copies the third. This is one possible copying that you could have. Now, copying seems a bit arbitrary. There's actually some genetics behind it. When we say copying, what we really mean is we think that the target and reference have both inherited this segment of the DNA intact from their common ancestor. Right? So it's identical by descent, or they've inherited it identically by descent. And when it switches, we say, well, from here on out, they've inherited this, this stretch of DNA intact from some other common ancestor. But it's a common ancestor of the target here and the reference sample. So if we, if we can estimate you know, what segments are inherited identically by descent, imputation becomes very easy, right? So here we would, in, if they've inherited the same segment of DNA, we would impute an A here, we'd impute a G here. The problem, of course, is estimating the path. You know, you could have another path. This also matches at these markers, at the genotype markers, but we would have a different, here we have a C, there we have an A, we have a conflict of what we would impute. When we're figuring out these paths, the key thing we're looking for is stretches where the reference haplotype and the target haplotype have the same alleles. If, if we have long, long enough stretches where they have the same alleles at the genotype markers, we can be increasingly confident that, that it's a segment that's inherited identical by descent. So we have multiple paths, and these are just <coughs> multiple paths that match the genotype markers. We also want to handle paths that don't match. So here's an example where we have a path that, that has a mismatch at this genotype marker, but we want to be able to consider it. Uh, the reason is real data we have to consider it. The genotype error is m more common than we would like, so you can have a mismatch because of genotype error. Haplotype phase error can cause a mismatch. And of course, 
even if your data is perfect, you can still have a mismatch because of mutation since the common ancestor. Could be the ancestral common ancestor had a C, but along the lineage for the second reference haplotype, it flipped, changed to an A, or vice versa. It could be the target haplotype has inherited a mutation. So we have to consider essentially all possible paths. It, and the way we do this is we apply a probabilistic model. So this model gives a probability to every possible path. And this probability will be lower or downweighted the more mismatches we have, because that's, you don't expect mismatches in identity by descent segments where you've inherited the same DNA. So it's going to be lower the more mismatches. It's going to be lower the more switches you have, the more time it goes from one haplotype to another, because the more switches uh, you have, the IBD segments get shorter, and you have less confidence when it's shorter that it really is identi identical by descent. So once you, have, you consider all possible paths, and you have a probability associated with each path, those probabilities across all paths will sum to one, you're ready to do the imputation. And the imputation from this point, I think, proceeds fairly straightforwardly. You have a, a marker you're trying to impute, and then there's four different reference alleles at that marker that your path could go through. through. Every path is going to go through one of those boxes, right? And only one. And if you sum all the probabilities of the paths that go through the first box, we call that a state probability. Each of these reference haplotypes, these alleles, is a state, a, a hidden state in our model. We don't actually see what path we go through, but we can make inferences based on probabilities. Each of these is a state, and this state probability is the sum of the probabilities for all paths that go through that state. The second state probability is the sum of the probabilities of all paths that go through that state. And so we get these state probabilities. And then we, from those, we can get the imputation, uh, the, uh, do the imputation and get a posterior probability. So the probability that this allele that we want to impute is an A is just the sum of the state probabilities that are it's an A. The probability it's a C would be the sum of these two state probabilities where it's a C. Or if you want to think of it another way, the probability that your allele that you're trying to impute is an A is just the sum of the probabilities of all the paths that carry an A there. It's a C if it's a sum of all the probabilities for the paths that carry a C there. So conceptually, it seems to me this is a very elegant, very straightforward, high-level view of the problem. But there's a little wrinkle. There's a lot of paths. So current state of the art is about 50,000 reference samples, 10 million variants on chromosome 1. That's a lot. So the number of paths is 10 million to the 50th thousands. And that's terrifying. Put that into perspective, number of atoms in the observable universe is estimated to be 10 to the 80th. <laughs> So this looks like a non-starter. And it would be a non-starter if we didn't have some really amazing algorithms that have been developed in the past. So one of these amazing algorithms is the Baum algorithm, uh, which when it's applied to this context because of the structure of the switch probabilities, you get something, you get a linear algorithm. It, I mean, the, the scale of improvement here is just amazing. You get number of markers times the number of samples. So you double the number of markers, the compute time should go up by two for the Baum algorithm. Double the number of samples, it goes up by two. That's usually the best you can hope for because typically you double the sample, you know, double the input data. Just reading it in from disk is linear in the in the you know number of bytes. So linear is usually the best we can hope for. But at the end, you'll see uh, sublinear algorithms. We can actually do better. It turns out. So the imputation output, as we mentioned, is allele probabilities. It, if you have two alleles, which we'll call just A and B, it suffices to just give you know, the probability for one of the alleles. Here I'm giving the B allele probability. You can get the A just by taking one minus the B probability to get the A probability. And once you have these probabilities, you can convert this into whatever you need. You want hard call alleles? Fine. You can get hard call alleles on the first haplotype of the person. It's going to be an A because that has 98% probability. Second haplotype, it'll be because that has 86% probability. You want genotypes? Well, we can give you genotype probabilities, too. If you assume Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, which just means the alleles are independent, which is not a very strong assumption, the probability of a B homozygote would just be the product of those probabilities, 0.02 times 
The other thing you can get is an expected allele dose, which may not be the first thing you think you'd want, but this turns out to be very important. So how many copies on average would a person that has this gene, these genotypes in this part of the genome, how many copies on average of the B allele do you expect them to carry? And you get that by just adding together those uh, B probabilities. So you get, on average, 0.88 copies. The reason why this is important is for this application, this main application of imputation, which is to association testing. So when you're doing association testing, you're looking for correlation between the number of copies of an allele you carry and a trait. That number of copies, which sometimes called the dose, is 0, 1, or 2. If you have true genotypes, well, here we can use the same testing methodology, the same regression-based testing methodology, where in, the predictor is now is not an integer 0, 1, 2. It's a real number between 0 and 2, and everything just carries through. So it makes it very easy to use this imputed data in testing. Okay. There's uncertainty in imputation. That's why we capture that uncertainty with allele probabilities. More uncertainty than you'd have for sequence data. Why would you do imputation? If sequence data can do more than imputation can. Uh, it can be, it's applicable to more situations. Why would you impute? Well, it's, it boils down to cost. Current cost for high coverage genomes that I've seen is around $800 to $1,000 a genome. SNP array data is much less. I think on the order of $50 to $100 per genome. And because SNP array has historically been less and still continues to be less, we have millions and millions of individuals with SNP array data. You have an individual with SNP array data and you want to generate sequence data on it, you have two choices. You can go with the, the Lexis option, $800 to $1,000 per genome. Or for those old enough to remember it, you can go with the Yugo option, which is uh, a penny a genome. Right? If the, the uncertainty in imputation is, is, if your imputation is good enough and it can do the job you want, well, why not pay the penny, not the thousand? Right? So that's why imputation has been so useful. For many applications, it's good enough. Oh, yeah? So what are the components of all these costs? Do they count for the reagent, for the computer infrastructure? What's uh, the, the sequence people would know this exactly. I do know that. Yeah, the sequence people grumble that this doesn't include everything. You know, it doesn't include the informatics. It doesn't include this or that. I'm just pulling these because these are the, the figures people use, but I'm not quite sure exactly what, what the limit is. In practice, yes, it'd be more than that. This is uh, the compute time, essentially. The compute time, and it, I guess it would also include the, the disk. The, the disk, that's often a, a big component of the cost, too. I guess I'm curious, uh, I should follow up very briefly, does this include labor? Labor is often one of the, labor intensive <laughs> operations are very expensive. Well, it, I'm assuming the data has been prepared, okay. you know. And other than that, you know, it, yes, this takes 10 seconds to enter the command, let the computers do their work. Computer's cheap, your time's expensive. Right. Now this, the people who actually you have their hands dirty doing sequencing, they'll, they'll be better able to discuss. I'm sure this, I know this doesn't include all the costs. I'm just trying to be generous. I just, just want to, yeah? Uh, I'm not very familiar with this topic, but uh, I'm just wondering if, the, uh, if a, a SNP can be imputed 100% uh, confident, then does that mean no additional information is actually added? If, uh, you add that impute that SNP because it can be predicted by all the other SNPs you already uh, sequenced. You are correct. And we'll, we'll talk about a measure in just a minute called R-squared. If your R-squared is 1, that means your imputed data is just as good as, as true genotypes. Uh, just as good as for sequence data. But you, you want your uh, R-squared to be high. But the higher the confidence is, it seems like less additional information you are providing uh, by impute that SNP. Because it can be predicted by other. I, th I think I know what you're saying, but remember you're adding information from the reference data set that's not in your data. So you're actually at the process of imputation is taking your data plus the 50,000 sequence genomes. So you're, you're, there is more information coming in. You don't have the information just from your own data. But you already have the, uh, you have those 
uh, genotypes in those uh, SNPs that you used to impute that? But just your study sample is not enough. You couldn't impute these markers with just your study sample. It's the information is coming in from the reference panel. Yeah, but this is a common stumbling block. It's, it's sort of like if I have the information to impute, and somehow there is some association where I can impute, say, from four markers, this one, and I, learn, I have to learn that from the reference panel, but still, like, a huge advantage of imputation is that you once you have that one marker, you can do the single marker test. So the information is there, but spread across many loci, and the downstream analyses don't know how to use that. The downstream analyses know how to do single marker association. So, like, you can, like, in te technically, no, you can get no, there's, there's a, test, no, right? actually, that's, that's not it. completely correct because there's, it's true that, let's say, you're using four SNPs to predict one, and it's perfect prediction, right? But there's many functions of four SNPs, okay? But actually, the reference panel tells you that there's actually a real variant that that function predicts. Another follow up to that is sometimes you want, we'll be interested then in time mapping, right? Or, or which one of those SNPs might be important. So you might want to know which other SNPs could be genetic variants, maybe the, the potential. Yeah. That's, that's, that is a good question. So, yeah, it's a, and I. I Thank you very much for the way you answered it. That's that. That's true. And I, you had. Did you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering how good the reference um, reference genomes are, and if there is like good enough coverage to believe that you can accurately impute any um, like any individual. Uh, it de it depends more on the marker. Lower frequency variants are harder to impute. Uh, it also depends on whether your reference panel came from high coverage or low coverage sequence data. Right now, most of our reference panels are low coverage, but that's changing rapidly. And we're now high coverage reference panels are coming in line, and that's going to help quite a bit. Uh, I will we'll, we'll actually touch on your question on slides coming up. So if I can defer that, we'll hopefully you'll answer by the end of the t we'll have an answer by the end of the talk. And if not, feel free to follow up with me. Let's see. Okay. So. If you're interested in how much uncertainty, you can think about it in terms of accuracy, but it sometimes helps to think of it in terms of uncertainty. How much uncertainty there is. At an individual genotype, the allele probabilities give you the answer. But for many applications, you want to know my uncertainty at a marker. For example, association testing, you want to know, is this a marker I should just filter out after imputation because there's too much uncertainty, or should I carry it forward and actually do the testing? <coughs> and the measure we use for that is what we call R squared, where R is a statistical common symbol in statistics for correlation. So R squared is the squared correlation. And it's the correlation between the true and the estimated allele dose. And on first glance, this looks somewhat useless because you don't know the true allele dose, right? That's why you're imputing. So it's chicken and egg. But what makes R squared useful is that you can still estimate it even if it's not well calibrated, or even, even, even if you don't have true gene types, provided that it is well calibrated. And for most higher frequency markers, except when you get into very low frequencies, the calibration is good enough. And you can estimate what the R squared is. And if the R squared is zero, that's bad. No correlation means there's no relationship between your imputed data and your true data. But if the R squared is one, your imputed genotypes are, if you take the best guess genotype, they will be perfectly accurate. So you can estimate this without knowing the truth. That's what makes it so useful. And it's also useful because we can interpret it in terms of statistical power to detect association. And that relationship is surprisingly simple to express. If you've imputed a marker, and remember R squared is a measure of accuracy across samples at a marker. If you've imputed a marker and you test that marker, your power is roughly equivalent, similar, to testing true genotypes with R squared times N samples. If you have N samples, and you test with imputed data, it's roughly similar to testing with true data, R squared times N samples. So the last bullet point is just an explicit example to make it clear. You might have an R squared equals 0.5 in a marker. Testing that marker using your imputed data is going to have similar power to testing as if you had, with true data, which you don't have, but if you had true data, testing true data but getting rid of half your samples.
So it gives you some intuition of what R squared means in terms of testing for association. What determines accuracy? The major, the general factor is reference panel size. Reference panel accuracy also comes into a into play here too, but that I think is going to become less of an issue once we move into high coverage sequencing and very large panels. The accuracy should be pretty good. But bigger reference panels have more variance in them, more polymorphic variance, and there's more variance that we can impute with little uncertainty or another way to think of it, high accuracy. At a particular marker, the best predictor you have is the minor allele count. Uh, minor allele frequency is, a predictor, is only a predictor if you know the reference panel size. And if you combine frequency with reference panel size, that's just a more complex way of saying minor allele count. General rule of thumb, if you have 30 or 40 copies of an allele in the reference panel, you can impute it general, typically with fairly high R squared, like R squared 0.7 or higher, 0.8 or higher, if you have 30 or 40 copies, with one caveat. That rule of thumb works pretty well as long as the reference panel sizes aren't humongous. If they do get humongous, it doesn't work so well because it, it's assuming that the mutation that you're observing, the allele you're observing, came in from a single mutation event. If you're in a situation with millions of reference samples, that assumption breaks down because of recurrent mutation. You may have an allele in your, in your sample and it actually came through multiple, you know, two or more mutation events. But for, you know, in the hundreds of thousands in outbred populations, this minor allele count as a predictor works pretty well. And if you have 30 or 40 copies, you can do pretty well for purposes of association testing. In other words, you can do well and get a high R squared. All right. First part of this talk has been didactic, you know, just an overview of imputation. But this is a methods, work, you know, a methods um, conference. And so the rest of the talk is going to be methods. We're interested in making imputation fast, but you'll notice the theme of most of the methods I present are not really, their, their motivation is not to make it fast. They often, many of the methods I, I'll show you will make it fast, but the big thing that keeps you awake at night if you're developing methods for really large data sets like this is memory. You can't make something fast if it won't run, and if you're using too much memory, it's not gonna run. So that's, that's the first goal. And fortunately, many of the things we do to get the memory down are also going to make it fast. The first is something, the standard building block. It needs to be said for completeness, and that's windowing. You break up your genome into overlapping windows, and then you do your analysis on just a single window at a time. <coughs> then you print out your data up to the splice point, which is the middle of the overlap. You do the next window. You print out the data up to the next splice point, and you work that way. So you're not having to do a whole chromosome or a whole genome in memory at once. You want overlap so that you don't lose accuracy near the boundaries, right? We're interested in allele sequences that match between a, tar a target haplotype and a reference haplotype. We don't want to miss, in we don't want to lose information about matching allele sequences by cutting off, cutting off right at the splice point. So we go beyond, and then that's the information on each side of the splice point gets trimmed off. So this is the foundational technique. It's necessary, but not sufficient. We have to come up with other techniques. So we want to deal with millions of reference samples. So we have to deal with how to compress that reference data. Yeah, John? What's your go-to window size strategy? Uh, you'll see an example later where it's going to depend on the reference panel size. For relatively small reference panels, I, you're always better off having longer windows. So if you have enough memory on your machine, do a whole chromosome if you can handle it. But I'd feel comfortable three, four, five centimorgans or megabases with small reference panels. But you'll see for really large reference panels, that's not good enough. And I'll talk about why sort of later on. So let's say you have millions, or in, or in this example here, a million haplotypes, and you want to compress that data. Uh, fortunately, we can use the structure of genomic data. Most markers, if you've worked with sequence data and looked at allele frequencies, most markers are low frequency. Typically, half the markers in an exponentially expanding outbred population, typically half the markers are singletons. The vast majority of the markers in your reference panel are going to have less than 10 or 20 haplotypes that carry the alternate allele. 
So that's a feature of the data that we can use to achieve some very high compression. So if you have a million haplotypes, in, a million reference haplotypes at a marker, and only five of them carry the alternate allele, the natural way would normally be to have a vector or an array of a million values that give for each haplotype the allele that's carried. But we can do compression and just store the indices of the haplotypes that carry the minor allele. So instead of a million values, we have five. That's a huge amount of compression. And the nice thing about this compression and, and another compression method I'll show you in just a minute is we can use the data in compressed form. It's not like gzip where if you have, gzip does some nice compression too, but when you read it in, you have to uncompress it and work it in the big, big format. Here we can actually work with the data in this compressed format. I haven't, it's lossless. I haven't lost any information. You want to know what alleles carried by a particular haplotype? Doesn't matter what haplotype, I can tell you. Haplotype 107, what allele does it carry? I look through my list, I see it carries 107, it carries a minor allele. What about the 108th haplotype? What does it carry? I look through my list, 108 is not there, it must carry the major allele. It looks like, well, it's got to be slow re retrieving data, and it is somewhat slow, but it's not too bad because you can put these in ascending order and use a binary search and get logarithmic search <laughs> searching. So this works for the vast majority of markers because the vast majority are low frequency. The high frequency, we can use a different technique. Again, we're going to use the structure of the data to achieve compression. So the high frequency data, we use the fact on short chromosome segments, the number of allele sequences, the unique allele sequences is not that high. So for example, here, the, um, there's three color-coded allele sequences in this toy example. You have green, orange, pink. You have six haplotypes, eight high frequency markers, so the total is 48 alleles, six times eight. And instead of storing the full natural data, you instead store a compressed version where you just store the unique allele sequences and a pointer that goes from the haplotype to the allele sequence. It's lossless. You want to know what any particular allele is, I can tell you. If you want to know what is the eighth allele on the first haplotype, I just go over here. I first look at the pointer, see it's carrying the green sequence. Then I go to the green sequence and read off the eighth marker. In real data, this can also achieve some very, very high compression ratios. And again, we don't have to blow up the data to its natural form to work with it. We can leave, work with it in compressed format. So that's reference panel data. Unfortunately, that's actually not our biggest challenge. The biggest challenge is storing the state probabilities. Because the way the BALM algorithm works, it's an amazing algorithm, but we have to allocate memory for every state probability, which Remember, that's every uh, hidden state is every reference haplotype at every G polymorphic marker. And for 100,000 reference samples, which will be there in a, a few months, and a two megabase window, which is maybe even too small. It's as small as you'd want to go here, and it, it may be too small. You may lose accuracy. You need about 50 megabases per CPU core. And it's set per CPU score because we want to use the full capabilities of our compute server. These compute servers often have many cores, like currently our lab's buying compute servers with around 20 cores. So 20 times 50, that's a terabyte. We are not buying compute servers with a terabyte of memory. That's expensive. So, and this, you have to compress the state probabilities. Is that, is that gigabytes or megabytes? Uh, that should be gigabytes. Thank you very much. <laughs> that's... <laughs> Thanks. That was a typo. That's GB, gigabytes. And yeah, megabytes is like, <laughs> get off the stage. What are you even worried about, you know? <laughs> All right. So this isn't the whole library of techniques we use to reduce memory, but here's, here's three techniques that we can fit in. First, this was introduced in, a, in Beagle 4.1. You run the Baum algorithm using only the genotype markers. So I've masked out everything that's not genotyped. And so you're left with state probabilities just in these regions where you have a genotyped or an observed, in other words, an observed allele on your target. In this toy example, it doesn't look like that's much savings. But in real data, this is a savings of 99 or 99.9%. .9 huge savings in the number of states you have to store probabilities for. It's also 
because of the way the BAM algorithm is, it's a huge savings in the computation time for the BAM algorithm. Again, we're talking on a really large reference panel, this is a three order of magnitude improvement just by this. Yeah? One clarification, what's the um, bit precision you're using to store all these probabilities? I, uh, I'm using floats for four bytes. Four bytes, single, and that, single precision floats? Yes. And that's satisfactory. I, I wouldn't be using it if, it, if, it, if I was losing accuracy. Can you use half precision floats? Um, I'm, in, I'm in Java, so it doesn't naturally come with that. I mean, I'd have to implement that on my own and be slower. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know if you would lose accuracy there. But again, that's, we're talking a factor of two. This is a factor of a thousand, you know. <laughs> we're, we're hunting for a bigger game here, you know. I mean, I'm saying that, you know, and it's, it's not that it's a factor of two versus a thousand, it's a thousand versus two thousand. Oh, yeah, it's, it doesn't, it's not a natural, uh, naturally uh, available in Java, or I would have experimented with it. But this, this seems to, to do the job. So you run the Baum algorithm just using the genotype markers, and then what you can do is instead of storing all the state probabilities, you just store them at the important uh, markers, the important state. So what's important? Well, we have a measure of that. It's the state probabilities themselves. If the state probability is relatively high, it's important. If it's low, it's not. And if you want to intuitively, here I'm, I'm saying I think these states would probably end up being the ones that would be important after running Baum's algorithm, because these are the ones where you're matching the observed the observed allele. So what this allows you to do is you just approximate all the unimportant states by zero and you ignore them. And this is one of those things that, again, it's going to reduce the memory we have to keep in memory because it's, we're just storing some of the probabilities. <coughs> and it's also going to have benefits for computation because when we do go to impute these markers, we have fewer haplotypes, fewer states we have to consider. The last thing we do is we delay imputation until output. So it's sort of a delayed gratification. We go through and instead of when we process the sample going through and imputing its data, which would be the natural way to do it, you do the Baum algorithm, you impute the alleles. We just do the Baum algorithm for all the samples without imputing the data. We just leave the imputation step until the very last moment when we're going to output the file. Because when we're going to output the file, we're going through the data in chromosome order. And so we, instead of having to impute the whole chromosome or the whole marker window for a sample, we can just focus on a very small segment between two genotype markers, which is instead of being 250 megabases or 40 megabases for a window, it can be 5 KB. It's very small, very low amount of data we have to have in memory and, and do computation on. And furthermore, we can use the fact that over these small intervals, often our allele sequences are identical and, and it essentially collapse identical sequences. So what we do is we treat this as a single state rather than two, add the state probabilities at this end, add the state probabilities at the other end, and then treat it as just one haplotype. So what ends up happening is when you do your imputation and you're doing this imputation on output at the, at the end, you may have started with 10 million or 20 million reference haplotypes, but when you actually go to do the imputation, in most cases you have one. You've gone from n equals 20 million down to n equals one, and that is a huge savings, both in memory and computation time. You, you kind of mentioned a little bit on the state space, but do, do you have any redundancies in transition space? Like in the standard least events, you know, there's only two types of transitions. They have like just two values. That, Would that help you a lot? That helped us. Yes, it, it does help a lot, and it helps when we talked about the Baum algorithm being linear. Mm -hmm. It would not be linear in the, in the number of samples if we didn't have that structure. So that structure helps at that stage when we do the Baum algorithm. Yeah. Yes? Um, I want to clarify, do the, do the windows have prefix size? Can't they be adapted based on like, the ID structure or something? Uh, you mean uh, back a few slides ago we were talking about marker window? You can have them adaptive, but generally the simplest thing to do is you just, hopefully you've got memory down big enough where you can have, you know, like the default in the new version of Beagle that'll be coming out is 40 centimorgans. You just want them long, it's simplest to just have them longer than you need. But if we were really tight, yes, we could look into adaptive window space or something like that. And Sriram? So, uh, in terms of variation, the where you can kind of trade off memory for 
Yes. yes. I have used those in the past. The memory is down low enough for this approach that I don't have to use, uh, uh, what, what do we call that, those algorithms, uh, checkpointing, checkpointing algorithms. I don't have to use that. And if you're wondering what checkpointing algorithms are, you can look at the first Beale imputation paper talks about them. They're not novel to that paper, but that's where you can look them up. Results. <coughs> The first is just an R, a bunch of different reference panels looking at R squared. The R squared values between 0 and 1 here. The minor allele count here, notice it's on a log scale. And the reason for that is, is the only interesting part for the minor allele count in R squared is the very lowest frequency markers. And using a log scale allows us to zoom in on that. Once you get up to a few hundred copies of the minor allele, your R squared is sort of high enough and somewhat uninteresting because you're imputing well. 1,000 Genomes Panel, Haplotype Reference Consortium Panel, this has around 30,000 samples. And then Simulated Reference Panels, this is 10 megabase of simulated data with different sizes, 10K, 100K, 1 million, and 10 million. And just as an aside, it takes some patience to get 10 million simulated samples. Took a little bit of work. Notice all the methods are pretty much on top of each other, and we're considering five. The last, most recent two versions of Minimac, the most recent two versions of Beagle. Beagle 5 is not yet released, but it will be as soon as I can write up the paper. And Impute 4, the most recent version of Impute. All the R squares are on top of each other. And as you'd expect, the correlation goes up as your minor allele count goes up. What this is just showing is that the different approximation shortcuts everybody's making, we, we've been pretty careful not to lose accuracy. We're all right on top of each other. Yeah. How, this kind of, uh, how can you explain the small peak at four in a, a HRFC? Uh, my guess is it's just an artifact of how that g panel was produced. This low coverage sequencing data, they had to take some shortcuts. That's, it, that's my guess. I haven't looked into it, but I, that's what I think is probably going on. Something like they masked five tons, below five tons. So that could have an impact too, yeah. So you have fewer markers that are correlated in that bin. Yeah, that, that could be could be the filtering they did. Thanks, John. I think they might actually have imposed a minor little kind of threshold of five. Uh, and uh. so I don't know what, what sort of got through it, but yeah. across this range. Like yeah. Yeah, I don't don't lose sleep over that. It's you know, it, it is something that you notice, but you know, it's not the key the main thing here. Is yeah. there a, a stratification by ancestry there, or these are all European? Mostly European samples. It does include the thousand genomes, though, but it's predominantly European in the HRC. I see. No, I mean like all these, these figures, because you have like thousand genomes panel and everything. Uh, uh, no, there's no no stratification here. We just took two, our target was two samples from each co each population in thousand genomes, I see. and we excluded those from the reference panel. Okay, so this is an average across ancestors. Right. Yes. Uh, yes. Average R squared. Like leave one out on the SNPs or how do you? Uh, no, we, we just took samples. For the 1,000 Genomes panel, we took two individuals from each population, took them out of the reference panel so that they weren't no longer in then, and we, then we imputed. Well, we're, ma we're masking. You know, we have sequence data, and then we're masking, doing the imputation, and then looking at the... Masking how one at a time, or...? No, we're masking, we're masking everything that's not on the array. We were using... a. Uh, for this, we were using a 2.5 million array. For the simulated data, a simulated 1 million array. Thanks. Yes? Do we know anything about an upper bound of uh, R squared as a function of minor leaf count? I haven't seen any theoretical work on that. It would depend on the population structure, but I haven't seen any work. Okay. This looks like it's a contradiction to what I was saying about all the methods on top of each other. It's an apparent contradiction. It's just an artifact of the fact that the methods actually weren't run the same way. The only method currently that can handle 10 million reference samples is Beagle. So these are the two versions of Beagle. The more recent version, its memory footprint is about 10 times less, a factor of 10 less than Beagle 4.1. So Beagle 4.1 is using too small of a reference panel. It can only use four and a half centimorgans. And for this huge I'm, I'm sorry, it's using too small of a marker window, four and a half centimorgans. And for this huge reference panel, that's not big enough. And this goes to what you were asking a minute ago. When you have a really huge reference panel, the IBD segments tend to be very long. And if your window is too small, you can't see the full IBD, length of the IBD segment. If I just used a bigger computer or 
use the newer method, it's not a problem. Yeah. Uh, did you guys look at the uh, PPWT? I haven't looked. I mean, it's something I'm interested in, but it hasn't been published. And you know, it's really the developer's res you know it, responsibility to publish. I have just in personal conversations, and my in and it fits my intuition. Intuition. It's going to be a little less accurate, but very fast. Yeah. But I, you know, it, it's it's just not a method that's been published. It's been out for a few years, but nobody's taken the work to, to write it up. But it, it must work reasonably well because it is implemented in the Sanger server. All right, this is uh, imputation time, <coughs> left-hand plot. The main thing to pull away from this plot is that the, the more recent methods are all down here, the most recent versions for all methods, whereas the older Minimac and the older Beagle are the ones way up here. So just in the last couple of years, there have been huge improvements in accuracy, or not, not, not accuracy, huge improvements in speed. For the 10 million reference panel, Beagle 5 is about 600 times faster than Beagle 4. You've seen plots like this that talk about the drop in sequencing costs. This is uh, from a recent paper, and it's just pointing out that the sequencing costs have dropped by five orders of magnitude. This is a log scale in units of $1,000. Five orders of magnitude in 15 years. Everybody knows about this. Not everybody knows that imputation methods blow this out of the water. <laughs> it's like been 10 orders of magnitude in 10, in 10 years. Just in the last five years alone, it's been in a five orders of magnitude up to what I'm showing you today. Here's a blow up of just the most recent methods so that we can focus on down here. Minute impute 4 it has a built in limitation because it only uses two bytes. It can't go up to 1,000 reference samples. It <coughs> uses two bytes to, to index the reference haplotypes. So I just have a 10,000 for that. Mini Mac 4, very nice method. I can get up to about a million with that. And then here's Beagle 5. The, the striking thing about the right hand plot is we're getting sublinear scaling. E, Mini Mac 4 is sublinear, not as easy to see. Beagle 4 is clearly sublinear. Going from here, 10,000 to 10 million, that's a thousand fold increase in the number of reference haplotypes. Compute time's going up by a factor of eight. So that seems impossible, right? Reading in the data should scale linearly. Well, it would be impossible if we didn't use these compressed formats. So the same compression we use internally, Minimac and Beagle have, their, have ways to compress data internally. We also store it in that same compressed format. So developing the first time we generate that compressed format for the, sequ for the reference panel, yes, that's going to scale linearly. But that's a one-off cost. You pay it once only. So these, once you've paid that cost, everything else allows sublinear scaling. Question? Yeah. This, this figure on the right is when you're zooming into part on the left. Is that right? That's right. Using just the, the three, three most recent methods that are down here. That's exactly right. Thanks. Last slide. Title promised the one penny imputed genome. So. This is, this is, the, this is the, the calculation. So we wanted a timing test. We took 10 million reference samples. We only, just because of time constraints, we only simulated 10 megabases, but that wasn't a good enough stress test. So we took 30 copies of those 10 megabase ref region to get a 300 megabase chromosome. That's a sufficient stress because that's longer than the longest human chromosome, which is around 250 megabases. And uh, it makes calculations simple because it's about one-tenth of the genome. So we can do our compute trials, get the time, multiply it by 10 to get a genome-wide imputation time, because we're imputing a tenth of the human genome. And uh, comes out when you're imputing batches of 1,000 samples at about 45 to 50 seconds on a computer that's about three years old. It's not the state of the art. It's 12 CPU cores, 128 gigabytes of RAM. If your compute costs are less than 72 cents an hour, which is achievable in many contexts. You're talking about a penny a genome. So yes, using the most recent methods, we can really drive that compute cost to where it's trivial. I want to thank collaborator Sharon uh, and then Ying Zhao, who's a postdoc who did all the, the analyses in this talk. And I also want to 
since it's a methods conference, shout out to MS Prime, which is a program that made it possible to generate these huge data sets. Thanks. So thanks.